Good afternoon, everybody. I think we'll, uh, we'll make a start. Um, thank you very much for all coming out on this bracing afternoon, and particularly cold over the last couple of days. So I do appreciate you all uh, coming along for our final uh, presentation in our Gender and Leadership uh, seminar series uh, for this term. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce you all to Dr. Stephanie Schiller. Um, she's Associate Professor uh, in the Centre for Applied Linguistics at the University of Warwick. Uh, Stephanie's research interests are professional and political communication, and she's particularly interested in leadership and the crucial role that communication plays in leadership performance. Stephanie's researched and published widely on various aspects of leadership, discourse, gender, and the multiple functions and strategic uses of humour, politeness and impoliteness, identity construction, the role of culture, decision making and advice giving, and other aspects of workplace discourse in a range of professional and medical contexts. In 2008, Stephanie's book, Leadership, Discourse of Work, Interactions of Human, Gender and Workplace Culture, was published by Palgrave, and more recently, uh, her 2016 publications include uh, Not So Innocent After All, Exploring Corporate Identity Construction Online in the Journal of Discourse and Communication, and Challenging Hegemonic Femininities, The Discourse of Trailing Spouses in Hong Kong in Language and Society. Stephanie is currently involved in several research projects, including one on crisis leadership and global governance, and exploring the role of culture and leadership and discourse and on telegenetic counselling in Hong Kong. And I think she's going to be talking to us on the topic of gender and leadership discourse at work. So over to you, Stephanie. Thank you very much. You can give her a warm IGS welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. It's really a great pleasure. Um, I'm really looking forward to this Um, just a little word of warning, you have heard I'm a linguist, um, so I'll be looking at a lot of disc uh, discourse today, but I'm aware that there may not be as many linguists in the audience, maybe even none. So um, I've tried to tone down the linguistic bit of it, um, and I try to use very little jargon, but if it does creep in, just do ask please, okay? Um, Okay, and the other thing I probably need to say up front, um, today I, 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 I thought, given that we have quite a mixed audience, I tried to give you an overview of a very, very, very broad, very complex area, um, drawing on my own research, and I'll also be using a few examples um, of the research of my colleagues, but I'll, I'll acknowledge this every time I do. Okay, so gender and leader dis uh, leadership discourse at work. Well, you know, what's the problem? What's the issue? Why, why do we need to worry about this? And as I was preparing for today's talk, I found this cartoon, which I thought just really nicely encapsulates this problem. So you see a boardroom full of men, um, and one who looks like the chair is on the fold, presumably a woman, and said, frankly, I don't see there's a problem, but why don't you girls put your heads together and write us a report? So, yeah, why don't we? Um, so, yeah, what is, what is the problem and, you know, is there a problem or is it just something that, you know, some people um, make up? So I thought, um, let's start by looking at the bigger picture. Let's start by looking at some, some numbers. So these are some fairly recent numbers from um, the OECD gender browser, browser. I don't know if you've ever been there, so it's a brilliant tool. Um, and they show the percentage of board seats in listed companies held by women um, in 209, and this has not dated since, so this is still the most recent number. So you can see Norway is, you know, quite progressive as we would would expect, given you know that they have this this quota in place since I believe 2001. Germany, you can see at the bottom of the pile, only three percent of the board seats in Germany um, are occupied by women, and the OECD average here just about 10 percent. So that's pretty bad. That's one in ten. <coughs> Um, just some more numbers, which is um, about the, um, the pay gap. So I, I think the, the previous slide quite nicely illustrated this infamous glass ceiling that I'm sure you've all heard about. So these are just some more numbers um, to illustrate the pay gap. And again, we can see that the OECD average is 18%. So on average, across all the OECD countries, women earn 18% less than men. And Korea is leading the way with a pay gap of 38%. And Hungary seems to be the only country um, where the pay gap is, where, where, where there is no pay gap. And men and women are actually paid the same amount of work for the same, sorry, the same amount of money for the same for the same kind of work. Okay, so this is 
Um, this is the, um, um, just the kind of the, the numerical um, background. So um, I think the numbers quite quite clearly show that you know gender is an issue and that gender discrimination uh, does take place in in the workplace context. Um, so here are just kind of some more facts that I quickly want to show you, which are also taken from the OECD browser. So um, in all again across all the OECD countries, women are still less likely than men to participate in the labour market, and they tend to work less hours, which means that more mostly women are in part-time jobs. Women are less likely to work for pay, and they are concentrated in less wage well-paid sectors and have lower hourly wages. Women spend twice as much time as men in unpaid caring activities, and that of course relates largely to childcare and looking um, after elderly um, people. Women are also less likely to reach decision-making positions, so again, this infamous glass ceiling, and I've shown you some numbers just now. Um, yeah. So it's a it's a pretty a pretty dire situation really. Um, so this is as I said just kind of to give you to give you a bit of a background and to establish right from the beginning that yes gender does matter. Um, what I want to do now in the in the remaining time is to talk a little bit about concrete examples and to talk a little bit, a bit about what what this kind of bigger picture of gender means for the realities that many women experience on a day-to-day -day, um, basis in their, in, their, in their workplace. And I'm going to look in particular um, at, at language. And just, just before I talk a little bit um, about leadership, I've got um, another nice example that I wanted to show you, which I think quite nicely shows that gender is everywhere in a workplace context and that even when people are not explicitly talking about gender, they are very aware that they are gender stereotypes. So this is an example that um, I think first appeared in a book by, uh, sorry, a paper by Janet Holmes and Meredith Mara. Um, they have recorded this um, in a meeting in a New Zealand workplace, and which is a meeting with men and women um, present. And you can see that the women here have, um, have, have a go at the men, they make fun of them. So Clara, who's the boss, and we'll, we'll meet her again later in another example, she says, oh, he wants to get through months and first. And then in a smiling voice she says, he can't multitask. And then only the women laugh, the men don't. Mm -hmm. And then Peggy, one of the other women, says, oh, it's blokes, eh? And then everybody laughs. And then Clara, it's in the genes. And then, you know, Peggy laughs some more. So you can see, um, this is really quite a nice example of um, how people make gender an issue in their everyday um, workplace interactions and how at the same time they mobilize and they orient to gender stereotypes. So in this case, you know, they make fun of the fact uh, that men can't multitask. But th th there are other examples where um, Oh, I have a lot of examples in my data, one of my colleagues um, has, data, has examples in her UK data as well, where the women in particular make fun of the fact that they are the odd girls out, so they are often very aware that they are special in a, in a, in a male-dominated um, workplace. But I thought it would be nice to have an example where the men are the, the butt of the humour. Um, and so, what looks like innocent humour actually has an edge to it, okay? And so it's not, it's not just a way of you know, or, you know, we're all mates, you know, hence, hence we can be humorous and funny with each other. Um, but it's, it, it's also a way, in, in this case, I think, um, to criticize the men. And as I said, in, in, in a way, people are orienting and making explicit um, gender here. Okay, so what does this all mean um, for leadership then? Um, again, just to give you a little bit of background information about why and how gender might be relevant um, for leadership. The first one, the first point up there is the fact that leadership itself is already a gender concept. So when we think leadership, we automatically think male. And I don't mean we as the people in this room, where hopefully this may not be the case, but you know, people generally. And a very good example of this is um, in term two, I always teach a module called leadership and teamwork. Um, and in the very first session, I think it's one of the first things I, I get the students to do every year is I ask them to make a list of the people they consider to be a leader and then we put it all on blackboard, whiteboard, not blackboard, anymore, all on whiteboard. Um, and it 
it's overwhelmingly men. I think it was about two years ago, I had one male student, bless her, who said my mother, which I just thought was so brilliant. But most of the time, it's, it's, it's people you would expect. <coughs> it's, you know, famous people like, I don't know, Martin Luther King, um, Obama was there. Um, but yeah, very, very few um, female, female, um, female figures. Um, the, the other thing, of course, to do with this is that a lot of people, when they hear the term leader, they still think about this hero leader persona, about this, you know, kind of lonesome cowboy who rides into the sunset, kind of saving the world, which is very, very masculine. Um, yes, yeah, so, so, so leadership itself is quite a masculine concept, has quite a strong masculine bias. Um, and then another aspect of this dilemma is that ways of doing leadership um, are often associated with masculinity. <coughs> so again, when we think about leader, leader or leadership, um, kind of typical attributes that come to mind is um, being authoritative, strong-minded, decisive, aggressive, competitive, confident, single-minded, goal-oriented, courageous, hard-nosed, adversarial, etc., etc. So all of these attributes, again, are associated um, with masculinity. And very often, other ways of doing leadership are overlooked and are often regarded as something else, as, as something other than leadership. So they may be doing teamwork, they may be doing support work, but it may not be considered um, as leadership. Although this seems to be changed, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to say a few things about this later. And the last point I'm going to mention here, just very briefly, is that there still are only a very limited set of roles that are available for successful women leaders. Um, so, some of these roles that have been identified in the previous literature are the role of the mother. So, if a woman kind of portrays herself as a mother, then it's okay for, or acceptable for her to be a leader because she can be caring yet strict. So, that's, that's one of the roles. And, um, um, well, the, the, the German Chancellor Angela Merkel, she is one of the more known people who's, who's been portrayed as a mother sometimes. She's also been portrayed as various other ways, as I'm sure you're aware. And so sometimes she's called Mama Merkel. Um, the, the role of the seductress is another one, and I've got an example to illustrate this later, where people say, you know, this person has only made it to the top because she's used her femininity, her flirtatious, whatever. As I said, I've got an example of this later. Um, and the third role is the role of the pet. So somebody, oh, you know, she's so cute, she's so cute, 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 cute you know, let's just take her along, let's, um, you know, so this, these, these are, as I said, a very, very limited um, set, of, set of roles that are available um, for successful women leaders. Okay, so um, we're getting towards the more linguistic part of the, of the talk. Um, and what I want to talk um, in the remaining time is basically three different aspects of, as I said, a very complex topic. Um, the first, I want to talk about issues that are experienced by women in leadership positions. Um, the second one is to show you some common perceptions of women in leadership positions. So what do other people think about women who have made it to the top? Um, and then I want to end on a few examples about leadership in action, to, so to show you how women actually do leadership when they are at the top, okay? So first talk a little bit about perception and then about, about how people actually do it. Um, and as, as, as I was preparing for today's talk, I thought what would be nicer than, as I said, just showing you my research is to give you an overview and to show you that this is actually not something that I've only found in my data, which is largely New Zealand data and Hong Kong data, but I've got examples from colleagues who've worked on data collected in Greece and Denmark, in the UK, so a whole lot of, of, um, of, of other social cultural contexts just to show that we're really dealing with a global rather than a very localized um, issue. Okay, um, so the, the, the first study, or yeah, the first study I want to talk about is um, was conducted um, by Charlie Martani in 2006. Uh, on women leaders in Hong Kong, and this is not an academic publication, but she she um, she did some work for for um, um, a, a charity organisation in Hong Kong, um, who was who was doing a lot of work with with women leaders um, in Hong Kong, and so she interviewed I think about twenty um, um, twenty some of them quite famous 
um, and quite public figures in, in Hong Kong. Um, so she's looked at leaders um, in, in, in the business domain, in the politics domain, and in the sports domain, and she's interviewed them. And these are just some of the quotes um, that these um, real women uh, leaders say when they recount their own experience. So the first one, that they're all anonymized, so I don't know kind of which industry, what, what leader is from, so I've just taken them from this brochure. Um, so people would be very critical if they had to promote a female instead of a man, because people still continue to believe men are more capable than females, that men can devote more in terms of time, devotion and energy. And another woman said, at all times I have to prove that I am no worse, but even better than a male colleague, in terms of commitment and results. If women want to achieve the same position as a man, women have to work harder. And this is um, fairly recent stuff. Um, yes, so you can see there, there are a lot of stereotypes that come up in these, in these quotes. So, you know, the idea that, you know, men are better suited for leadership positions um, and that women, women have to work much harder um, and to be, to be better um, than, than men if they, if they want to achieve um, the same kind of success. So as I said, these were based on interviews that she did um, with women leaders who have made it to the top about their own experiences. And you can see that gender is still very much an issue for them. Um, this is an example from an interview that one of my colleagues um, has done with um, a female um, leader in the construction industry, con uh, construction engineering, engineering, construction? Anyway, she, she, she's an engineer, um, in, in Greece. Um, and you can see that there, that there are quite similar things coming up there. So she says in the interview, I mean, there's still this macho identity we have to put up. I mean, there's this myth, right, the idea that a woman is not tough enough to work in a site Yes, it is this idea of being physically tough, but you see, this is not rational. Uh, rational. We are not workers, we are chartered engineers. And I mean, the intentions are often good, especially if you have a good relationship with people. They, and she's referring here to her male colleagues, just want to protect you. There is this idea that you are fragile. And when I was younger, I wanted my company to send me to a project in a particular country. But it was out of the question. <coughs> this is too risky for a young, beautiful woman. Woman, I remember I was told, bollocks, I was fuming back then, and still get annoyed when I come to think about it. I was to go and do site management, I would be perfectly safe. I wish I had the guts back then to put my foot down. So <coughs> there's a lot to say about this, but you can see how this woman, a leader, talks about the macho identity that characterizes the, this industry that she works in. Um, and, and the idea that it's, it's, it's about physical strength, so something that she lacks just because she's a woman, and how her colleagues use this very often under this kind of umbrella or cloak of, oh, you know, we're just caring for you, you know, we're really interested, we only want your best, but really, you know, we don't want you to go there and do this, okay? So we'd, yeah, we'd rather do it ourselves. So this idea that some kind of work <coughs> is gendered and is maybe more suitable for men and for women. Again, this idea of, you know, stereotypes, the idea of women being, um, being, being fragile and having, having to, be, to, 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 to be looked after. And really what this boils down to in this case is quite clearly <coughs> discrimination. Okay? So they don't let her go, although she quite clearly was. But you know, she's a woman and she's beautiful so, and young, so that, that doesn't, doesn't work. Um, one last example here, um, which is taken um, from some research that um, Louise Molani did a few years back about leaders in the UK. And this is not so much about how the women leaders perceive themselves, but this is rather how their male colleagues or their male subordinates perceive them, which again is quite interesting. So this is an example where David says about his female boss, I have no doubt in my mind that she has used her sexual uh, wires, if that's the right word, <laughs> I, you know, to get what she wanted in the business, and that probably to some degree uh, has had a negative effect on me. So I found myself less able to exert my influence based on skill uh, in the light of others' uh, ability to apply their sexual influences. And Martin, um, in the same study, says a similar thing about another, uh, about, about his boss. Some women can play the fact that they are a woman, and other women um, just tend to be more emotional. I've 
found the then man, which isn't someone I particularly want to work, I don't, I particularly want to be working for a person who's got emotional highs and lows, you know. I want to be working for someone that I know where I am when I'm with them. And a little bit later in the interview, which I haven't put on here because I think it's really quite painful, he says that for one week a month, um, you know, he can't talk with, her, with his boss because she's just too, yeah, she, she's just too, you know, emotional and, yeah, mm -hmm. irrational. Um, but, you know, this is really quite recent stuff, so this isn't like 50 years ago. I mean, this is what always gets to me when I, when I read this stuff. Um, so, yes, again, I mean, this is so full of stereotypes, and I was talking about this, the seductress idea earlier, the seductress as a role that is available um, to, women, to, 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 to women leaders, and this, this, this comes through, through here um, as well, which, of course, is, it is a role available to them, but, of course, it's a trap. You know, if, if, if you portray yourself as a seductress, then um, you, can, you can only lose. Um, and the same in, in, in the second example where women are portrayed as being sexual, manipulative and irrational, uh, emotional, uh, manipulative, not qualified and quite clearly not nice um, to work with. And as I said, the, the really sad case is that um, these are not um, kind of, you know, isolated examples, which is, you know, one of the reasons why I've tried to take um, yeah, research from, from all over the world. So, yeah. um, so I've, I've, I've got a quote in, 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 in my own research with um, one of the leaders that, that we interviewed in Hong Kong, which I, think he, which I think quite nicely kind of sums this up. And she said, um, during an interview that I did with her, she said, well, in Hong Kong, but I think it applies to everywhere really, she said, leadership and corporate life have been described in a certain way and mostly by men. And she says, you know, this world just isn't open just yet um, for, for women and for, for women leaders. And that, that was an interview that I've done probably about five or six years ago, so not, not too long ago. Um, and I mean, what we find again and again in, in, in um, research on leadership and gender, and what I find a lot in my own research is that Certain discourses, such as the discourse of work-life balance, for example, or discourses of motherhood and femininity, they are very often ignored in, in mainstream or hegemonic um, leadership discourse, and they're just, not, they're just not part of it, which means that every time a woman kind of wants to make her way up there, it's just so much harder, and it's just so much more work um, um, to be done. And again, I've got a nice little cartoon um, to illustrate this, which you can't probably read, so I read it out. So this is the woman um, who wants to, yeah, to start work there. And the, the guy who just talks out says, Mr. Bigmeister says you may come in, but only if you promise to respect the present hierarchy of dominance, which I think quite nicely illustrates this idea that, yes, well, if you must, if you insist on playing with us, well, fine, but only if you play according to our rules. Okay? Um, yeah, so as I said, I quite, quite like this. Um, okay, so so far we've talked mainly about perceptions. Well, I've given you a bit of background, then we've talked mainly about um, how women leaders perceive the situation and how they are being perceived um, by, by the male, male colleagues. Um, now, in the next, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes, depending on how much time that will give me, um, I've got a few examples to show you um, how women actually do leadership. Okay, so um, I want to move on to talk about leadership in action and to look at how it's actually done. And perhaps not surprising enough, although every time you know you open the newspaper you'll think otherwise, um, women are actually displaying a whole variety of different behaviours, just like men, surprisingly. So there is not just one way in which women do leadership, the and one way in which men do leadership, which means that questions like, so who's the better leader, or how do women do leadership, doesn't make any sense, because it's just too complex to answer and to say, they do it like this, they do it like this, I can tell you who does it better. So I don't have any answer to this, but rather what I'm going to show you is that sometimes, of course, when women do leadership, as when men do leadership, they reinforce their gender stereotypes. So there are, there's evidence in my data and in other in other people's data to show that yes, 
sometimes women behave in ways that we would stereotypically expect them to behave, but there is perhaps more evidence of behavior where women do leadership in ways that challenge gender stereotypes. But what you still, what you very often have is that both research as well as kind of pop, uh, you know, popular media, that they tend to focus on the reinforcing aspect rather than the, um, the challenging aspect. So in, in a way, I often have the impression that people are just looking for ways um, to, to support their often stereotypical claims. Um, okay, um, I feel I need to say a little bit about discourse now. Um, and um, as, 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 as I said in, in the beginning, and as, as, as you know, I'm, I'm a linguist, so I take a discourse analytical approach to leadership. So I'm very much interested in how people do leadership through language. And the big advantage by taking or of taking such a discourse analytical approach to both leadership and gender is actually that we're able to capture and describe leadership and the activity of doing leadership as it actually takes place. So leadership practices in situ. So such an approach is able to move away from these often stereotypical perceptions by men and women about something, how, how, how they perceive something to take place. But we can actually look at, okay, well, yes, this is what you think you do, but we can look at what people actually do do and how it, how, how it is perceived um, in, in, in action. And this, these kind of um, more, more recent ways of approaching um, leadership are very much in line with um, recent conceptualizations of leadership as a performance, a process, and an activity. So something that people do. And as I said, you know, with, with discourse analytical tools, we can actually identify where, where the leadership takes place. And that also enables us to critically ask well, whether gender is indeed an issue in everyday practice, and if it is, you know, where and how, and how is this enacted. Um, so it, it, it kind of, it, it provides a whole new set of evidence, so to say. Okay, um, <clears throat> so if we stay kind of within this approach, then um, there's quite a lot of, of um, research that um, has identified and described certain behaviors and practices that are indexed for leadership, such as decision making, getting things done, telling people what to do, um, managing meetings, solving disagreements, etc., etc. So there's a whole list of activities that people say are very closely associated um, with leadership. And what I want to focus on um, today is different ways of making decisions um, and getting things done, and to show you how, how different ways of doing this have been associated with femininity and masculinity respectively, and how both men and, 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 and women leaders, and in particular women leaders, um, how, they, how they make decisions and how they, they get things done. <coughs>
Perhaps we could move that forward, maybe we could ask him straight away. So you can see they are quite different. Um, so they, all of them are hedged, they are more indirect directed, and they're often in question form. So rather than telling people what to do, it's put as a question, you know, would you, could you, could we, perhaps. Um, there's also a frequent use of we, um, so you know, maybe we do this, maybe we do that, although we all know some, very often it means you go and do it. Um, there's also this high frequency of modal, so a lot of we might, would, um, um, perhaps, could, and again, these behaviours are stereotypically associated um, with femininity. So, so far, so good. Um, but what he also found, <coughs> excuse me, in his study, and which is supported by a lot of other studies, is that, yes, there is evidence of women behaving in kind of stereotypically feminine ways and of men behaving in stereotypically masculine ways. Nevertheless, if you look at all the behavior of all the leaders, regardless of gender, you will find that they all preferred more feminine ways of giving direction, uh, um, um, ins instructions. And that masculine ways of getting things done were the clear exceptions in his corpus. And as I said, there's, there's evidence um, by other researchers to support, to support this. So although we may think that, ooh, you know, this is nice that we see this, 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 this overlap or this, 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 this is coinciding with our stereotypes and what we actually see. This is actually the exception. Um, and what happens, in fact, is that in authentic workplace interactions, people do draw on a very wide range of behaviours. Um, and this is true for male and female leaders. And as I said, they both reinforce gender stereotypes, but they're mostly challenging them. So I've got three more examples um, to show you of women leaders, again, in, 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 in three different um, kind of social cultural contexts, um, who very much challenge um, these, these kind of stereotypical assumptions in their everyday interactions. Um, the first one's taken from my own research um, on Savita in Hong Kong. Um, Savita is the CEO of a highly successful um, NGO, and this is um, how she gets things done in her email. So her emails would just say something like this, can you work on this? No hi, no thanks, no nothing, just can you work on this? What are you doing about this? And then Bonnie, and I put the C in square brackets because there was a typo, um, can you please write a blurb about this in other, e sorry, in other events for our website? So you can see they're very direct, short, unmitigated directives. Um, it's you rather than us, us, so she's very clear about who's expected to do what, um, but still some of them are um, in, in the question format. So this, she's really displaying relative masculine ways um, of giving, giving directives in, in these emails. Um, my second example comes from New Zealand, from Clara. You will remember we had her, she was one of the, 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 the that's blokes thing. People. So Clara is one of the um, senior managers in, 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 in a corporate organization um, in New Zealand and this is um, her and her team discussing um, in a meeting screen dumps. I don't know if you know what screen dumps are? It's something like screenshot basically. Um, so Harold says, look like there's been actually a request for screen dumps. I know it was outside of the scope but people will be pretty worried about it. And then she says, no screen dumps. And then Matt says, we no screen dumps. And then Peggy says sarcastically, thank you, Clara. And she says, no screen dumps. Mm -hmm. And then he says, we know, we know you didn't want them, and we earn, we. And she says, that doesn't meet the criteria. Okay, so she's very, very clear, very authoritative, um, very direct, unmitigated decision. So she's decided there's not going to be any screen dumps. So that's it. She doesn't even discuss it with them at this point. They have a discussion before in the meeting, but not at this point. This is also potentially face threatening um, because you know she doesn't she doesn't mitigate it. She doesn't say something like, "Ah, oh, yeah, you know that's a good idea. Yes, we've discussed it, but thanks for bringing it up again." She's just like, "No." Um, so you know, very unilateral decision making here, um, and we could say a very overt way um, of exercising her power. And again, these behaviours um, are clearly indexed for masculinity. Yet, she's a woman, not surprisingly. 
Um, again, one of the things that I always do uh, with, or not always, but that I, I often do with my students um, in, when, when we talk about um, gender, I've got a, a module on professional communication where we talk about gender for a whole week. And just to make them aware of their own stereotypes, I very often give them this example without the names, and I give them about two minutes to write names just next to it, and you, you probably would, would have guessed it anyway, they get you wrong. So Clara is almost always a man. And of course it's not, I don't care what names they give them, I just want to see whether they think she's a woman or a man. And this, this really nicely illustrates to them that we have these ideas about how men and women stereotypically talk, or how they're supposed to talk. But as I said, when we look at what really happens in real workplace, how real people talk, there's so much variation there. Okay, last example um, is from um, Jan in the UK, and this is taken from Judith Baxter's um, data, which she collected um, in, yes, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, a British corporation. Um, this is also quite interesting. Again, Jen is um, the senior manager in the company, and this is, this is in a meeting. And she says, I don't agree because the guys did a financial forecast. They fucked it up, sorry. Um, they have to do it. It's as simple as that. Give me a break, lads. You say to me you don't have time. Sorry. Do it right in the first place, and then we're all right. And then there's a pause. They didn't do it all right in the first place. Sorry, I should have said the, these signs, they mean things are said at the same time, but it, it, it doesn't really matter. And then this says, I know that, and then Jen again, I'm telling you we'll be in severe danger of losing that, losing it, not good. Just do it properly. And then there's a bit more um, a discussion afterwards. And the, the, the discussion actually goes on in this particular example. But again, there's a lot of um, interesting things going on here. You can, you can see that Jen quite strongly expresses her her, her views and that she uses she uses quite strong language and you know again quite direct and quite simple syntax here they have to do it it's as simple as then give me a break do it right so very very kind of you know don't di direct there, she's also expressing her disapproval quite directly there's very little mitigation there um, direct to the point very confrontational style um, again which evokes association of of masculinity. And so all the three examples that I've, I've shown you just now, they all very much challenge the gender stereotypes that not only a lot of people have, but that are prevalent in a lot of workplaces really um, around the world. Okay, so um, what does this mean then? Um, there is considerable evidence gathered in many, many studies on leadership and gender in different social cultural contexts, and obviously I've only had the time to choose, I don't know how many, for today. But what all this evidence shows is that there is no direct link between gender and actual leadership performance. And the funny thing is that there, although there are still people who do studies comparing how men do leadership and how women do leadership, there are also meta-studies, so meta-reviews, where researchers have reviewed I don't know how many studies, and they show exactly the same. They just show, show that although they're individual studies which show, yes, there is a difference, if you look at the bigger picture, there is no difference. But, and this is the important point, and this I believe is why gender is the initial, why it's important that we look at it, why there may not be a difference in actual practice, women and men in leadership positions they are perceived very differently. And what we, what we find again and again when we talk to people is the same behavior is perceived and evaluated very, very differently. And as I said, this is something that we find basically all over the world where this research has been done. So there is something um, about, about leadership and gender or about gender I think, that makes it, makes it so pervasive. Um, the other thing that's, that's perhaps, I don't know, ironic if you want to put it nicely or tragic if you, you know, want to perhaps put it more realistically is that um, there's increasingly an acknowledgement amongst academics as well as, as practitioners that so-called feminine ways of doing leadership um, are actually appreciated and are, are considered to be, um, you know, kind of the way forward. There's talk about a female advantage about uh, of doing uh, leadership in particular industries. 
And there's also talk about a feminization of leadership and this idea that in today's world where we're kind of moving away from strictly hierarchical kind of top-down structures and organizations towards more flatter um, structures, that yes, what we need is feminization of leadership and more feminine ways of leadership. And this is all fine, and it's evaluated positively when it's performed by men. But when it's performed by women, it's still very often perceived negatively. So women remain disadvantaged um, in spite of these, these advancements. And this again, I swear, but I promise this is the last question I'm going to show you. Um, this again is a tool that I found which is brilliant. It shows exactly this. You've got the male leader here and the female leader there. They say pretty much the same, but as, as a response to the male leader, people say, oh, he's so successful. As a response to, to her, they say, she's an ambitious diva. He's a strong leader. What a control freak. He presents himself so well. She's such a flirt. Again, the seductress role there. His stuff is so original and popular. She's such a flake. He holds to a traditional view of gender. She's a feminist. Oh my god, a feminist. Um, he's so in touch with his pain, and she has a victim mentality. So you can see, you know, very similar behaviors. Um, yeah, perceived very, very differently. Um, so, yeah, kind of moving forward, what needs to be done? Um, and I'm about to finish, so <laughs> you should appreciate my timing. Um, so th there's a lot of um, suggestion that perhaps one possible way to, or one kind of productive way to move forward might be to try and almost like decouple the, the concept of leadership and gender. But as I said earlier, this may be quite difficult because and you're shaking your head, I think, quite rightly. Because I said the concept of leadership itself is already, already gendered. Um, so, but, but there's a lot of research that says really what we need to do as researchers and as practitioners, we need to show that practices and behaviors are effective tools of leadership and we need to talk about them in such terms rather than um, allowing them to be perceived as elements of exclusively male or female leadership. And you know, we've talked about associations with masculinity and femininity. So I'm kind of moving forward, we perhaps need to think about a language or a way of talking about leadership that kind of tries to leave gender um, um, out of the picture. And then of course another um, another kind of trend uh, which you know is is, 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 is is promising even though you know it, it, it is quite slow is that there is an increasing number of women in leadership positions worldwide both in politics in spite of the mm -hmm. US election um, but you know kind of generally both in politics as well as in, in business um, and, 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 and in other domains and that this is also contributing um, to the changing image of leadership and the idea or the hope is that the more the more we kind of see women in leadership position the more this gets normalized naturalized and then in a way maybe gender um, doesn't doesn't become so prominent and maybe this will contribute to degenerate um, the concept of, of leadership but then on the other hand we also need to be quite careful um, not to ignore issues of gender and leadership and not to say, you know, it is not an issue, but rather um, uh, avidly attempting to understand these issues um, and thereby we can help ensure that women have equal opportunity in attaining influential leadership positions, that organizations and constituents have access to the greatest talent pool when selecting leaders and that there is greater diversity in the ranks of leadership. Um, which in turn has been linked um, to organizational success. So I really want to end on this quote, which, um, yeah, hopefully one day will be true, that um, in the future there will be no female leaders, there will be just leaders. And that would be perhaps, perhaps, yeah. Yeah, we will see. But, uh, <coughs>